Hi everyone, welcome to today's product school panel discussion on managing stakeholder expectations. My name is Jenny, I'm a principal of PM at Disney in New York and I'll be moderating the session today. Um, yeah, and I'd love to kick it over to the panelists to do a quick introduction before we get started with questions. Um, great, Nithya, do you wanna get us started? Hi, my name is Nithya Chandrasekharan uh, and uh, I am a former Amazon uh, PM and I've had some experience working across a variety of large and small companies. I'm glad to be joining this discussion. Thank you, JT. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm JT Katzman. Um, I am currently a senior product manager uh, at Disney as well. Um, I've spent a lot of years uh, focusing on entertainment companies. So, uh, you know, been at a lot of big companies with logos that everyone knows, um, and I've sort of specialized uh, in entertainment for my career. Cool, and I'm Johnny. I'm a senior PM at Alloy. We're a Series C fintech based in New York, and we solve identity risk for financial companies. Great, thanks everyone. All right. Um... To get us started, um, one of the questions, and we're just starting to get go through questions that we put together. But obviously, happy to to take in other questions as well if we have time. Um, one of the first questions was, "How do you identify your stakeholders?" Um, I think Nithya, this this was a question that had come up um, that you had raised. Um, if, would love to hear your thoughts on it, and obviously everybody else, feel free to chime in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think when I was thinking about, uh, you know, how do you identify stakeholders, I was primarily thinking about it from like, you go into a new company, a new team, you need to quickly identify who your direct and indirect stakeholders are, right? So the direct stakeholders could be your peers, you know, in the product function, design team, your engineering, uh, and, you know, obviously, if you're a manager or a leader, then people who report to you and into the org and your another obvious stakeholder is your leadership group right people you report to and you know sort of the chain of command and there are other uh, you know stakeholders as well that you need to be able to identify quickly like different cohorts of customers if you are managing a portfolio of products uh, also like potential dependent teams that you are either in service of or stakeholders or dependent dependent teams that uh, you are dependent on Right. So really, I think it's super important that as a part of your like onboarding, as well as the first 60 days, you're able to get a good grasp of who are the stakeholders, what do you know, I and my team need from them, and what do they need from me. And also that sort of helps you understand like what sort of information you need to be communicating across all these different groups. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fantastic fantastic answer and I think yeah in line with that I would very much add the building relationships with those stakeholders as well you know uh, I think that's extremely important um, and then those might change over time too right like as your project your product or progresses like those stakeholder groups may may fluctuate so yeah I feel like it's an it's almost an ongoing thing um, to be managing stakeholders and of keeping those relationships and yeah, and also just helps, I think, both yourself and the team like better perform if you, you know, when you encounter a crisis or a problem, that's not when you actually go need to discover who, who the most important key stakeholders are. Yeah, absolutely. If I if I can also like add to that um, on that question, I, I think one thing that I've found helpful in my when I when I usually join a company is like ask the person that I just spoke to who else I should who, who else should I talk to because usually on similar topics or um, similar type of projects. They may know other people that I didn't know existed that I should talk to, they may have different contexts. So asking that question sometimes may lead to additional uh, stakeholders uh, that may be helpful. Sometimes It also helps with relationship building as well. Yeah, yeah. and I would add um, just one, one quick thing on the relationship building part of it, uh, absolutely super important. Um, but I think that's the first step to establishing credibility. You know, as a product manager, uh, there are moments in time where people are gonna need to trust in you uh, to, to do what you say you're gonna do and, you know, by the deadline you say you're gonna do it. 
um, that's very hard, especially when you join a company, um, when, when you're new and have, uh, you know, no credibility uh, in the minds of, uh, you know, all stakeholders. Um, it's, it's critical uh, to start building those relationships um, and getting little wins, right? So, um, you know, identifying small tasks, setting dates for when those tasks will be done and actually accomplishing those tasks are baby steps towards uh, establishing your credibility and goes a long way uh, in stakeholder conversations down the road. Yeah, I think those are all some, some super good points. And to, I think to add to that, like the, the credibility piece, I think communication and transparent communication, you know, to all your stakeholders, I feel like at least, you know, from a product management perspective, you, you'd rather over communicate than keep accidentally not have someone looped in, you know, which could potentially then lead to a small stakeholder crisis <laughs> down the road. So, yeah. I think also just to add to that, one uh, sort of interesting counterpoint to that is a very important part of identifying stakeholders is also identifying what sort of communication each of the party needs. It's a very, it's, you know, typically over communication is always better, but I've also been in situations where, you know, you're working on a product that, you know, some of the internal customers uh, use and, you know, it's a, it's a lighthouse partner, right? It's a working relationship and you go so far as to invite them into, you know, discussions around, uh, you know any any critical like milestones etc and then now it's it's uh, it's like you have to keep including them in all of these conversations and you are unable to manage the communication and the impact or uh, is sort of like outsized right now you can't like pair back so i think it's also important to identify like you know who the stakeholders are what sort of communication they need and also like you know how frequently right and what is the sort of tone and outcome expected from that communication are you asking for help or informing them because they have a dependency or are you asking for extra budget or you know people to hire right so it's really all of that sort of is the next level of conversation but i think it all sort of goes hand in hand with identify your stakeholders and then click another level deeper for what they need i also feel yeah. that self i, I just wanted yeah, to add go ahead. <laughs> I think that self kind of corrects over time, right? Because once you start yeah. working with people, you start to understand, okay, this is some the type of thing that this person may care more about, and therefore I would tailor the communication to that a little bit. But yeah, 100% agree on the point that like some over communication may be overdoing it over time. Um, so there's always the point of adjusting um, as things go. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. Johnny touched on something that's super important as well, which is not just the frequency of communication or the method of communication, whether you know, certain stakeholders prefer, you know, emails with lots of detail versus others that just, you know, need a Slack message here and there to, you know, uh, to understand that you're on the right track. But it, it's really tailing, tailoring your message to each individual. Um, you know, I think Nithya was, was saying about, um, you know, you have stakeholders across the organization. And, and even though, you know, presumably everyone you work with is, is a smart individual, people who work in the design area don't necessarily think the same way than people who work in finance or, uh, you know, j just different personalities hear things differently. And sometimes you need to tailor your message. Um, even though you're updating everyone at once, oftentimes you might need to tailor that message to your specific audience in order for them to truly understand what you're trying to say. Uh, I think I've spent, you know, <laughs> many failed attempts at trying to get a point across using sort of a blanket message for everyone and realized at some point that um, it, it's it's not a, a failure of them hearing what I'm saying. It's a failure in me making myself understood. And so uh, I think the role of a product manager, there's lots of um, sort of uh, sub roles. And one of those is a diplomat. Uh, you have to be diplomatic and, and sort of uh, talk to lots of different people about lots of different things. Uh, and not everyone hears things the same way. So I think that's part of what makes you good at, um, you know, product management and specifically stakeholder management is, you know, really understanding who you're talking to and tailoring your message for that audience. Yeah, could not agree more with, with all that's been said. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the 
just kind of trying to to go over to one of the next questions like I think in line with that like you're you're probably never going to make all your stakeholders happy, right? There's, you know, you're never going to be able to do, to build out all the features that people request, you know, so you're always going to have to draw the line somewhere. And one of the questions um, that we had put together as well was, how do you prioritize, right, your stakeholders? Um, I know Nidhi had originally brought up the question, but yeah, I'm happy to just kind of kick off that conversation. Yeah, uh, I think the one thing you touched on earlier is uh, holds especially true for this, which is this is one thing that you have to continue adjusting over time, right? Like, so once you've identified your stakeholders, right, like, for example, uh, customers, right, or like your leadership team. So as, as over the course of the year, if you're in the planning process, then you sort of engage more with one set of stakeholders and you have to be you know, probably talking more to finance as they plan in the budget uh, and leadership as you try to like communicate your themes and uh, overall annual planning and goals and OKRs and whatnot, right? Versus if you're, uh, you know, closer to a milestone for launch, you know, of course you still have all those, but you know, you probably need to communicate, over communicate with your engineering stakeholders, right? Like, and, you know, your program managers and the whole set of other different types of stakeholders, your marketing, PR who help with the launch. So. I think it really, you know, you have to have a framework for, you know, this is the time when I need to like stay hyper focused on on these groups. So we don't want to have anything like going sideways. Uh, but it's just uh, again something you have to adjust over time. I think. Anyone else have comments to add? Um, if I could put like a more meta point on on that, I, I think how we prioritize stakeholders, like how we sort of talk to them, what we tell them over time. I think ultimately that goes back to solving the problem that we wanted to solve, uh, which is like, it goes back to the product product that's being built, right? Like, so throughout, like based on the problem that, that we need to solve, who needs to be involved and who needs to move out more time. And I think that's fundamentally what drives the, how we think about prioritization over, overall. Like if like at some point of the project when we first when we first kick something off, and maybe the leadership needs to be involved so that we align on the strategic direction that we're going. But over the course of the project, as we get closer to launch, and maybe like marketing that needs to be involved a lot more because we need to make sure the messaging and everything is set up so that you know the product's ready to go. Um, so kind of so yeah, that's how I that's how I think about it. Yeah, and I, I would just add, you know, different phases. Um, require different prioritization. Um, you know, I think most people would agree that um, just depending on the, the type of product and how it's monetized, and if it's a revenue generating product, that often gets the highest priority um, in order to have budget, in order to continue doing other things. So, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, a lot of times it's a trade-off and, and you know, there's people who are not involved on the revenue generating side of things. There, let's say, let's just say again, I've, I've focused on entertainment for a large part of my career. So you often have people in, on the creative side that are creating content and um, have lots of requirements around how that content needs to be presented. However, you know, at the end of the day, none of that really matters unless there's revenue coming in to justify this product's existence, right? So you oftentimes need to make trade-offs um with people who are are you know requesting features and functionality um you know in order to prioritize um some of the more baseline uh requirements um that ultimately need to get done first in order to then have the luxury of working on you know things that are deeper in the backlog great yeah thank you everyone and i think we can maybe pivot over to a question, Johnny, that you had raised around how do we handle when there's misalignment with stakeholders? Yeah, that happens. That never happens now. <laughs> uh, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think my, my, the way I think about it is, first of all, it's important to understand what type of misalignment it is. Like, is it that like people have different information, therefore they come up with different kinds of conclusions or, or understanding of the situation? Or is that we already have the same information, but we have very different takes on what the next, uh, what the best approach is. Uh, I think it depends on the situation, you know, the, the, there are different ways to sort of go through that. 
Uh, if it's if people don't have the same information, great, just make sure everybody has the same information. Then this goes back to communication. It goes going going back to all the taxes we talked about earlier, how we manage that, how we make sure you know people understand uh, each other's takes. Uh, but if it's people actually, but if, if it's in a situation people actually have very different takes with the same information, then it's time to have a intellectual debate on like, what's what's actually the best thing to do, whether it's for the user, for the business, or for both. Um, and you know, that's when the trade off needs to be made collectively. Um, and I think on top of that, we also touched on relationship building. I think that's also very important. But ultimately, we're all humans. Um, we want to always only rely on logic and facts, but that's usually not always the case. So you know, we need to listen to the other side. We need to be genuine. There could be stressful moments, but I think at the end of the day, it's like, you know, teamwork that gets everything, gets everybody across the line. So. Yeah, I think one thing that has helped me, you know, when, like you say, stakeholder misalignment never happens, right? <laughs> so uh, the thing that I think has helped me quite a bit is like, not quite racy, but I always think of like, you know, there's always like one or two stakeholders that are critical to any decision making versus there is like a slightly larger group of stakeholders that have a slightly different responsibility, right? So sometimes just thinking through that uh, helps and you know, which information or which sort of opinion carries more weight. And again, to what Johnny said, like, uh, you know, are they making that uh, recommendation having all the data, right? Or is there anything, any course correction to be done? So, you know, to help lead them towards the same direction. So I think, you know, just to add to what Johnny said, like, when there is really like hard to break ties and you have stakeholders that have like completely opposing opinions and you have to continue making progress, like definitely also think about like whose in, in opinion or, uh, you know, uh, decision is critical at that juncture and that helps uh, definitely make progress. Yeah, I, I would just add it also helps to do, you know, regular presentations uh, or you know, whatever the methodology is, whether it's a deck or a presentation or, or something uh, to make sure everyone's at least pretty close to being on the same page with regard to what you're building and why. Um, level setting, if necessary, for those that uh, had a different impression of, of what was happening. Um, you know, there's always going to be, uh, you know, sort of resource collisions, right? You can only do a certain amount of work uh, in any given moment in time. And uh, there's likely going to be more requests than there are resources to fill those requests. Um, so that that's just, you know, a constant um, communication. Sometimes it's delivering bad news. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I found, it, you know, clear, concise, consistent communication is really um, the thing that, that helps avoid some of these misalignments with regard to uh, stakeholders. Um, just, you know, ha having a consistent message uh, and then delivering, like I was saying earlier uh, on, on that message, uh, builds that credibility and, you know, ultimately will sort of ease the pressure, I think, uh, often with uh, stakeholders who will kind of leave you to it um, as opposed to try to jump in and, and micromanage or, you know, whatever the, the situation may be. Yeah, thanks everyone. Oh, sorry, Johnny, you wanted to? Yeah, and, and, and I think touching on some of the things that uh, uh, others spoke about, I think there, there's a point of disagree and commit that, that like there's going to be a point like there's going to be a lot of debate, a lot of good ideas, but at some point a decision needs to be made and, and, and you know, progress needs to be, made, to be made as well. So I think disagree and commit sometimes sounds scary, but it's actually very important thing that we can we all get comfortable with and say okay I don't disagree I don't agree with what you're what, what the direction is but we'll go with it and then we'll pivot we'll learn and we'll we'll figure out the next steps yeah I think you, you brought up a fantastic point and it's actually a very good transition into one of the next questions um but I wanted to bring up around you know do you spend time also collecting feedback from stakeholders around what is working what isn't working you know I think you know, their mechanisms, once a project gets wrapped up to do a retro, you know, with engineering teams or other stakeholders, I'd just be curious to hear from, from all of you, you know, are, do you have certain mechanisms you use, you recommend, um, do you spend time on that? And yeah, how, how does it inform kind of your, 
your other projects going forward. Yeah, I think um, gathering feedback is certainly a, a critical aspect of the relationship. Um, you know, not everything goes right, um, but you want when things don't go right, you definitely want to learn from that experience and not repeat the same uh, issues over and over again. Um, again, it just goes back to credibility, right? So if you keep doing the, the things that uh, interrupt or interfere with your ability to succeed, then you're going to lose credibility with people. So uh, absolutely understanding what works and what doesn't work. Um, you know, with with uh, teams like engineering and design, you know, assuming you're building a product where you're all working collaboratively, um, th those are different. You know, they're assuming everyone works on a on a you know uh, agile um, framework, and you know we're working in sprints, and at the end of those sprints, you can talk about what worked and what didn't. That's sort of all built into the process, assuming you're following that process somewhat religiously. Um, you know, when it comes to it's harder when it comes to other stakeholders, right? So, um, is the marketing team getting what they need from you? Is finance getting what they need? Uh, did you check off, uh, you know, all the requirements with legal, right? Those those are conversations that don't happen as frequently as product manager to engineer or product manager to designer. Um, so those are a little bit harder to get feedback. Um, but I, you know, I found that you know just checking in a little. Uh, periodically, is this all working for you? Yes, no, what's not working? Um, that gives you enough to course correct if necessary to, you know, adapt your communication style or, um, you know, whatever the circumstance happens to be to, to those individuals to bring them more into the fold and, uh, you know, increase your credibility with them in general. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think in, in my experience, having like one on ones with a couple of stakeholders, you know, even if you don't work with them, like really regularly, at least once a quarter, just to understand like what's working, what's not right, like just are there expectations that, you know, we are completely missing uh, the point on right. So that kind of communication helps and also builds trust going back to the original conversation, right. So when, when you know, when it's time to actually you know, leverage the, the trust and relationship so it's easier to communicate going forward, like you, you already have it built, right? So uh, that de mechanism definitely helps. We also, you know, especially for companies like Amazon, right? Like uh, in my experience, we also typically end up trying to get in on like either the planning process or just one or the, you know, QBRs for some of the teams that are not uh, you know, quite adjacent to us, but we may need to work uh, closely for uh, some projects in the future. So that just helps us understand the motivations when they're coming to us with an ask or when they're asking us questions or when the expectation is somewhat misaligned to our roadmap, then we know where they're coming from. So that context helps immensely as a product manager and for my whole team, it, it just helps break down some of the walls. Those are amazing points i i and i i, I want to echo back to one of the points that we made earlier which is like, this is why relationship building is really important right because if we build good relationships then it's easier for the other side to share this is something that may not be working super well because usually you know we don't like to share bad news um and sometimes it may get in the way of like making progress and making you know being productive but building good relationship with different stakeholders definitely helps with that Yeah, thank you. Those were all really great points. And I think and just kind of touching upon um, a few points that were made before, I think the the part about building trust, right? Also being honest with yourself and with others, admitting failure where, you know, when needed and not pointing fingers but saying, you know, this didn't go as planned. And, you know, here's how we plan to pivot is a very, you know, very key part of, you know, it's okay when things aren't okay, but to be able to course correct is important. Um, there was a, a question that we had put together as well around how do you ensure you can keep your stakeholders motivated, um, you know, especially in, in potentially tricky times, you know, when, when things don't go as planned, like, do you have some, some things you would you know, advise other people to do that have benefited you in the past? Yeah. 
Yeah, I so it's funny. I've I've um, experienced a few interesting scenarios where, um, you know, I've worked in some very highly politicized environments um, where certain stakeholders don't necessarily want to help because if they help and the project fails, whatever it may be, then they'll be partially to blame for that failure, right? So it's almost a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If, if you don't get the cooperation and buy-in from everyone, then your project is most certainly going to fail. Um, so you really, it, it's really where those relationships come forward. And I think that's, these are some of the soft skills for a product manager, right? Is to, you know, not in meetings, not in emails, not in Slack messages, but, you know, maybe in person or, or whatever form in person takes nowadays when everyone's on video um, to, to, to really understand the individual, to understand the person, um, you know, maybe explain why their participation is uh, so critical uh, in order to, um, you know, reach the level of success we're all trying to reach with whatever it is we're trying to do. If it's a specific product, if it's a, a feature or, or a specific piece of functionality, um, if you need buy-in from other stakeholders uh, and they're being stingy with that buy-in, you need to figure out creative ways to, to bring them on board. Um, you know, the, the, the more official or the most official way is to sort of go over their head and, you know, force them to participate, but that's not going to get you the level of cooperation uh, oftentimes that, that you would want from those people. So it's better to solve that um, sort of at your level uh, and, and, you know, just kind of figure out what they need to be motivated, right? To be, you know, obviously success is a motivator. Um, you need to explain and, you know, do your best to, to uh, make them realize that their participation is gonna be the best, you know, route for all of us to succeed. Um, I mean, there's there's a million flavors of that, and I'm sure you've all dealt with similar situations. Yeah, I've I've encountered that particularly when you are like pitching a new idea, and uh, you know, most more often than not, the sort of reluctance or the lack of motivation comes from them not being able to understand, you know, what is in it for the, for them or the team, right? Because now to do X, you have to deprioritize something else, which is already on their roadmap and they have already committed. So. Usually, you know, in, in those cases, as uh, JD said, I think a one-on-one -on -one conversation with several, you know, members of that team helps. Like, definitely try to pitch the idea, right? Pitch the grandest version of the idea. What's the role that they play in it? Like, what's the, you know, what's the great outcome for customers that you're trying to showcase, right? So, I think uh, advocating and evangelizing for what you're trying to do in, uh, in whatever language that they can understand, right? I think that's that's really the the thing that has helped me. Uh, it doesn't always end up in a success, but that's the sort of path that leads to least friction. <laughs> when you're in finally in a meeting and you don't really want the key ally, you know, key members who need, whose critical support you need to like say no, that's one approach that's like historically worked. Yeah, thank you both. And I'm, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I unfortunately need to wrap up the session. Um, it was great chatting to all of you. Thank you so much for all the questions and, and answers and a, a wonderful discussion. And thanks to everybody for, for chiming in and listening in as well. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. thank you. You too. Bye.